Good morning, my name is Stuart Davidson. I want to say thank you for tuning in online to view our services. We hope that you'll enjoy today's service and today's message, and we also hope that it encourages you to come and worship with us in person. You can learn so much more about our church if you visit our website. You can visit our website at www.myesbc.net. We're also on Facebook and we're also on Twitter. So we hope that you'll be able to find out so much more about our church online. But again, come and see us. We have services at 8 o'clock and at 10 o'clock. And we hope to worship with you very soon. God bless you. Good morning, good morning. You know, communication is really important. Uh, every single week I, I come into the sanctuary and, and I sit down and, and uh, my wife sings in the choir. And a few weeks ago, I, we often have sort of this like sign language that we do to one another. I, I'll wink at her one week. Well, a few weeks ago, I, I, I guess I was feeling rather romantic and so I blew her a kiss. And it was a really wonderful thing except Ed Pickle sits right behind her and he caught it and he blew me one back. And I was a little... Ooh, a little awkward, I guess. Communication's tough. It's tough. A few years ago, <laughs> he's out of the room, so he won't get that. Um, but um, a few years ago, I was driving in the car with my middle son, Jack. And uh, Jack is, is great. Jack is funny. Um, Jack just sort of speaks his mind. I like that about him. And and I was trying to have one of these teachable moments. It was just me and Jack. And, and it's hard when you're a dad of three to have just a moment with just you and your son, right? And so Jack was in the car with me. I don't remember where we were going. And, and I decided that I was going to kind of teach him some spiritual lessons. And so I, I began to talk to him about Matthew chapter 5. And if you remember Matthew chapter 5, that's where Jesus talks about that guy that, that comes up to you and, and, he, and, he, and he wants your tunic, right? And Jesus says, well, you need to give him your other belongings as well. And, he, and then he talks about the other guy that says, well, if he forces you to, to walk one mile with him, you're supposed to walk another mile with him. And, and then he talks about the guy that, that comes up and he, and he hits you in the face, right? And, and then you're supposed to do what? You know, turn, turn the other cheek, right? And, and I thought, wow, I'm just such a great dad. We're just talking about the Bible and spiritual things. And, and so I said, son, I said, what would happen? What would you do, son, if, if, a, if a, a, another boy came up, maybe he's on the playground and he came up to you and, and he just slapped you right in the face? What, what would you do? Jack paused for a moment or two, and, and I thought, wow, he's really getting this. He is really understanding what I'm, what I'm trying to teach him. And he says, Daddy? And I said, yeah, Jack. And he said, how big is that other boy that slapped me in the face? <laughs> it's a good point, right? That's a good point. Well, in that conversation, it was, uh, it, you know, it, it kind of opened the door for me to see into Jack's heart and to see how Jack thought. And, and that's what conversation is, by the way. A conversation is really just an open door into someone's heart. It's an open door into someone's mind. A conversation is really just a verbal cue into understanding how someone else feels. That's why conversation is so important. And it's really important that we converse with one another in a Christ-like way. And how we speak to our spouses and how we speak to our children. Conversation is very important because in our conversation, we can either sow seeds of encouragement or we can sow seeds of discontent. We can either build someone up or we can tear someone down. Now, my spiritual gift, I'm not sure if you know what your spiritual gift is, but my spiritual gift is encouragement. Uh, even our, my staff sometimes gives me a hard time because I always try to find the silver lining. I always try to, to highlight something about sometimes even a bad situation. But I, I like to encourage people because I like to see what it does for them, especially people that are feeling really low. I, I like to try to build people up. So this morning, when you think about how you communicate, maybe how you communicate in the context of your marriage, I want you to ask yourself these questions. Is your conversation cutting? Do you use your words to cut other people? Now think about that for a second. Most every single person in this room has been cut by conversation. We've been cut by someone else's words. We've been cut, we've been abused, we've been hurt, and we carry those scars with us everywhere that we go, don't we? 
just a few years ago, I, uh, I went out and, and the Lord had burdened me about a, a person that I knew from my childhood. His name was Travis. And, and Travis was, uh, he was in 7th or 8th grade when I was in 7th or 8th grade. We went to the same school together. And I can remember as a 7th, 8th grade boy, I was a fairly insecure kid. I, I didn't exactly know who I was. I wasn't very comfortable in my own skin. And what was even sadder is Travis was probably even less comfortable in his skin. So in order to make me feel better, do you know what I did? I picked on Travis. I gave Travis a hard time. And as the years went by, I decided, you know what, I need to try to find Travis. I, the Lord had come into my life and had changed who I was and changed how I treated people. And so I reached out to Travis. I found him on Facebook, and I wrote him a letter. And I said, Travis, I'm sorry. I, I, I treated you poorly. You probably don't even remember who I am. But I just wanted to let you know that God's done a new work in my life, that he's changed who I am, he's changed how I treat people. And I wanted to apologize to you for how I treated you when we were in grade school together. Well, about a day or so went by, and Travis reconnected with me. He wrote me back, and he said, Stuart, I do remember you. I do remember you very much so. And I can remember the days where, yes, you bullied me. It were hard days, and I carry those with me all my life. But I want to let you know that I forgive you, and I, I accept your apology. Friends, you know what that did to me? That let me know that my careless actions when I was a 7th grader or an 8th grader carried on to a guy who's now almost 40 years old. Our words matter, don't they? Or are they cutting? Do you use your words to build up or do you use your words to tear someone and cut them down? Are you clueless about your words? Do you just not care? <laughs> do you just not care how you talk to people? Do you feel like people are sort of beneath you and that you're sort of at the top? You're the boss, they're an employee. You can treat them however you want to. Husbands, do you treat your wives in a very clueless manner? Are you clued into what they care about? Do you care about the things that really matter to them? Wives, do you feel the same way about your husbands? Or are you careless with your words? Or are you Christ-like? Now, I'll be honest with you, there's probably every, not one person, every single person in this room could use a lesson on how to deliver more Christ-like communication. Yours included right here. I'm at the very top. So we all need work on how we communicate with one another. You know, it's funny, we live in this digital age now where how communication has changed drastically uh, since even uh, when my wife and I, we were dating. Uh, back when Angela and I were dating, there were uh, no, no email um, actually, cell phones weren't really even in existence, which is hard to imagine these days, right? That there really weren't cell phones. How did we make it without cell phones? But there were no cell phones right when we first started dating. There was no email. And because of those things, there was no text. And, and so we were forced to go the old-fashioned route, right? If we wanted to express our love to one another, we had to go, do it the old-fashioned way, which is to write it on paper. Wow, Right? Now, Angela, she used to write me love letters, and oh, it was great. And I would turn around, and I'd write her love letters, and they were really fantastic. Well, now we live in kind of a digital age where love is shared in a different way. And, and young people now, instead of writing letters to one another, they wrote, write texts to one another. And I, I came across a text message that I thought was quite humorous. It's, it's a young man. He's professing his love for this young lady. And, and, and this is what he wrote. And this is over a, a, an, an iMessage, a text message on an, on an iPhone. He said, says, my love. Isn't that romantic? Oh, my love. Ladies, how many of you would like to start a conversation with your husband today when he comes out and says, my love, right? Wouldn't that be great? My love, if you are smiling, send me your smiles. If you are sleeping, send me your dreams. If you are crying, send me your tears. I love you. Oh, wow, right? Well, the young lady wrote back. She says, I'm in the toilet. What should I send you now? <laughs> Communication is different these days, isn't it? We all need to work on our conversation styles. And Paul, I believe, gives us some very helpful hints on how we can improve and further develop our conversations. If you will, you can open up your Bibles to Colossians chapter 4, verse 6. And these are Paul's words. We're going to talk three simple points about how we can speak to one another in a more Christ-like way and how we can deepen and grow our relationships together. 
It says this in Colossians 4, 6. This is the English Standard Version. It says, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Now, I like the New Living Translation as well. I don't often preach from it, but I think it's a a good parallel passage. It says this, again, New Living Translation out of Colossians chapter 4, verse 6. It says, let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive. What a great way of summing up that piece of Scripture. So what lessons can we learn from this one piece of Scripture, this one verse today out of uh, uh, Colossians 4, verse 6? One, three ways that we can care about our conversation. Fill in this blank. Roman number one is to practice. It says this. It says, let your speech always be gracious. Friends, Paul wanted the church to be different uh, the, the main way that outsiders would know that believers are believers, not just in how they acted, but in how they spoke to one another. They, they saw their speech patterns and how the church relayed information one to the other. And so the, he, he wanted the church to look so different that people would hear the different speech patterns of the church and wonder, why are they not talking like the rest of the world? Why are they not argumentative like the rest of the world? Why are they not so critical like the rest of the world? Why are they not so cynical like the rest of the world? Why don't the Christians seem to run their, them, each other down like the rest of the world does? And then that would give us an open door to share the gospel and to talk about Jesus to people because our speech is so markedly different than everyone else. Now, I believe that one of the most important words in verse 6 is the word always. He says, let it always be this way. Not sometimes, not just on Sunday mornings, not just on Wednesday afternoons and evenings, but let your speech always be gracious. That means it has to be gracious at work. It means it has to be gracious at home. For those of us that coach, it means that we have to be gracious at the fields as well. We have to be gracious with our speech always. This means that every day we must practice speaking graciously and attractively so that outsiders might hear the difference in our language. Friends, you may not think that speaking graciously always is that big of a deal. After all, how does practicing Christ-like speech influence others? Friends, trust me, when you practice speaking in a manner that is gracious to your spouse, it will rub off on your children. Your children will then carry the same speech patterns that they learn at home to school. It will rub off on their classmates. It will even rub off on their teachers. Let me prove it to you in a different way. I've lived here on the eastern shore for about six years now. Five of those years, I have had the great joy of coaching. Now, I've never really been a head coach. I, I've always been sort of an assistant coach, but I've, I've helped coach soccer teams. I've helped coach baseball teams, football teams, basketball teams. And it has been a true joy. It's been a wonderful experience having other men pour their lives and their time and their energy into my children. And at these ball fields, I get to run into different men from all different walks of life. They have all different types of beliefs. Some have no beliefs. Some have true, faithful, responsible Christian beliefs. And yet, as I walk into these situations, I'm confronted that, you know what? Not everybody works at a church. (laughs) And I know this because of how they talk. I've had the opportunity to speak to men who have some of the foulest language that you might possibly imagine. But you know what happens when the preacher walks in? You know what happens when when the preacher walks into a situation like that, when you've got a group of men, they're gathered together, and they're talking like the preacher's not there? What happens is those men clean up their language. It's always fascinating to me that, that they know what I believe. They know what I do. And they know that I try to always, everywhere that I go, speak in a manner that is gracious and attractive. 
People don't have to ask me what I do for a living because they know what I do for a living because I don't speak and talk like everybody else. And in that one moment, these men who were carelessly using their words occasionally, they will clean up their act just in that moment. You might be thinking to yourself, well, preacher, what does that matter? As soon as you leave that group, they're just going to go back talking the way that they are. And you're exactly right. But I will tell you this. For that one moment, those men are confronted with Jesus Christ. I believe in that moment where I enter into a situation because my speech pattern is so profoundly different, they are confronted with the reality of Jesus. And friend, just like I momentarily might have the opportunity to change someone's speech pattern, Jesus has the power to change people, period. He has the power to t totally transform someone's life. I've seen it happen time and time again. Friend, what happens when you walk into a situation where other people are using their words carelessly? Do, do they clean up their language around you? Would they even know that you're there? Would they even see Jesus in you? And, and here's another thing, husbands and wives. How do you use your language in your a marriage context. How do you speak to one another? Do you practice speaking graciously and attractively to one another in your home? Uh, ladies, I'll tell you this. If you want to see a difference, a change in your husband, change the way you talk to him. Ladies, if you want to see how your husband can, ch uh, uh, men, if you want to see how your, uh, your wives will change, then change the way you speak to them. Change the way you speak. Speak to them in a gracious, patient, kind Christ-like way. There was an elderly gentleman who, who loved to go running. And he would run around the track at a local high school. And, and on the track that day, he noticed that on the field, there was a football team playing. A, a high school team was practicing. And so he said, you know what? I am going to run as long as they run. He noticed they were beginning to run. He said, you know what, I'm just going to jog, and I'm going to run around the track until finally they stop running, then I'll quit running. So the elderly gentleman, he ran, and he ran, and he ran, and the high school team, they kept running and running and running until finally, maybe after an hour or so, the elderly gentleman finally just quit. He said, I've had enough. I can't go anymore. I, they're going to keep running, but I can't run anymore. Well, he noticed that when he quit, they quit. And a high school football player came over to him and he said, Mr., I'm so glad you got done running because the coach said we were going to have to run as long as that old guy kept running. <laughs> well, see, our actions influence others, don't they? Our actions influence other people, whether we know it or not. And friend, your speech, the way we communicate to one another as a husband and wife, can powerfully impact and change other people. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 11, it says, Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Men, when is the last time that you've encouraged your wives? Wives, when is the last time that you've encouraged your husbands as Christ would want you to? So here's another way, three ways to care about our conversation. One, we should practice it. But two, we need to understand that our conversation can be very persuasive. Colossians chapter 4, verse 6 again. It says, let your speech always be gracious and seasoned with salt. Now, it wasn't that long ago I went to the doctor's office, and the doctor gave me the very bad news. She said, Stuart, I hate to tell you, but you need to drop a little weight, buddy. It's time, it's time to start shedding some LBs, all right? And so I made a deal with my wife, and I said, okay, well, I'm going to try my best. We're, I, I'm going to start running, which I have. I'm going to try to start eating better, which I've kind of done, okay? And, uh, and so I'm trying to lose a little weight. Well, we sat down a, a few nights ago, and we were eating this meal, and, and uh, it was one of those healthy meals. Have you ever noticed, by the way, that healthy meals taste terrible? You ever notice this? I have. The healthy meals never taste like fried chicken to me right? Uh, or, or, uh, or, or chocolate cake. Uh, they just never taste that good. So anyway, I was eating this healthy meal. It didn't taste really good, and I did what everybody else would do, right? I picked up the salt shaker, and I began to put a little salt on it. And after I put a little salt on it, it made the meal a little more palatable. It made it a little easier to eat, if you will. Well, friend, as Paul here is saying, our speech should be seasoned with salt. 
It means that when we enter into a conversation, our presence should make the conversation more palatable. It should make it more engaging. It should make it more appetizing, if you will. Salt is important. Paul says our conversation should be seasoned with it. This means our conversation should add appeal or to, to, a, to another conversation. The manner in which we speak should call other people to join in. People, our husbands and our wives and our children, they should want to talk to us because of how we talk to them. As a matter of fact, I would challenge you to go back and read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Look at the example of Jesus Christ. Everywhere that Jesus went, people wanted to talk to him. People wanted to engage in conversation with Jesus. Thousands upon thousands of people, they would push in literally around Jesus as close as they could because they just wanted to hear his voice. Oh, friends, do people want to do that with us? Husbands, do your wives, do they want to talk to you because your conversation is so seasoned with salt? Wives, do your husbands want to talk to you because of the same reason. Well, maybe you're thinking this morning, well, how do I know if my conversation is seasoned with salt? How do I know maybe my conversation has lost some of its saltiness? Well, let's go over this. I I provide for you a test this morning, and you can take it in the quietness of your heart because these are easy answers, right? Number one, husbands and wives, how can you tell if your conversation is seasoned with salt or lack of it? Number one, when speaking to one another, are you prone to raise your voice? Friends, that's not salt, that's pepper, okay? It doesn't say speak with pepper, it says speak with salt. If you're raising your tone with one another, if you're shouting at one another, that's not salty language. That's more peppery language. Number two, when speaking to one another, do you you highlight the small flaws instead of the positive attributes? Number three, when speaking to one another, do you withhold important information that would be important or impact your spouse? Number four, when speaking to one another, do you play games? Do you try to make your spouse guess what you're thinking or the emotion that you're feeling? Number five, when speaking to one another, do you fold or cross your arms in a defensive manner? Do you use a body language, by the way, that would be a turnoff to your spouse? Meaning that you don't give her eye contact, which was one of our another, which is another question that I have. Do you give your spouse eye contact when you're speaking to them? Do you cross your arms? Do you fold your arms? Do you get in a, in a defensive posture? Number seven, when speaking to one another, do you turn off outside distractions so that you can devote yourself to your full attention to your spouse? Now, if Angela and I were being very honest with you as the congregation, we probably struggle with number seven more than anything else, okay? Case in point, I I had a very busy day yesterday. We had football games galore, and then right after the football game, I had to come home and I had to perform a wedding, And I love weddings. This was great. It was a wedding that was down in Gulf Shores. And so I immediately, we come home. Angela goes off to the grocery store. Not a lot of communicating yesterday between Stuart and Angela and the Davidson household. Now, I get down to this wedding. The wedding was about 30 minutes behind schedule. And so I finish it. I get in the car, and I turn on the radio to listen to a certain football game, okay? I'm not going to say what football game it was, but it kicked off at 6, and they were playing Kentucky, okay? <laughs> so I am I, I'm driving, and I, I, I missed the first quarter. I missed the second quarter. That's okay, because you know what, you know what I'm going to do when I get home? I'm going to sit in my easy chair. I'm going to eat some shrimp and, and sausage jambalaya, and I'm going to watch the TV. It's going to be great. I'm going to catch the second half. So I get home, and I, I, I'm getting ready, and I sit down, and I'm watching the game, and it's great. But do you, do you know what happens? My wife wants to talk to me. She wants to talk which is fine, and, and I'm, I'm watching the game, and I'm doing the typical man thing. Uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah. I have no idea what she's saying. 
No idea at all. Until finally I clue in, you know what, I'm preaching on communication. I can't exactly be the hypocrite and get up here and tell everybody they need to turn off distractions so they can listen to their spouse when I'm not even doing it myself. So I said, okay, so I'm going to pause the game. We're going to talk for, for a minute. I'm going to figure out what she's trying to say so I can engage with her, and then I can go back to it, which is what I did. But, friends, we struggle with this. We have three kids at home. We've got busy schedules. It is hard and difficult for Angela and I to communicate. When is the last time, guys and girls, that you have carved out time to spend with your spouse? One of the things that Angela and I do, and we struggle with this, we're not the heroes of this by any stretch, but one of the things that we do in order to find time to communicate is we will just go for a walk. We'll leave our phones at home, and we will just walk around our neighborhood. Matter of fact, that's the very first thing we did yesterday morning. We knew it was going to be a busy day, so we went on a half-hour walk around our neighborhood. Didn't take anything with us. We just went for a walk, and we talked about what was going to be taking place that day and even beyond. And it was great. It was wonderful. Guys, let me tell you something. If you really want to have an impact in your marriage, go for a walk with your wife. It'll make a huge difference. I promise you. Friends, if you raise your voice, if you take defensive stances, if you play games, if you withhold information or use your words to cut down your spouse, you are not communicating in a manner that is seasoned with salt. You are creating distance, not devotion. No one, uh, no one is going to want to talk to you if you don't have seasoned conversation. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, it says, Let no corrupt talk come out of your mouths, but only such that is good for building each other up as it fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Friends, our words are persuasive. We should practice speaking to one another in a Christ-like way. But lastly, I would share this word with you, that our words are also powerful. There is power in our words. In verse 6, it says, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Let's be honest, our speech is going to get us into trouble. There's not one person in this room who hasn't gotten into trouble by the things they say, right? All of us are guilty of that. We need to remember that our speech, our conversation, husbands and wives, that it has power. Husbands, within your voice, within the words that you say, you carry both life and death for your wife and for your children. Wives, within your voice, within the things that you say, you carry both life and death for your husband and for your children. We should guard and protect our words. Because they are powerful. If you will, if you can open up your Bibles to James chapter 3, verses 2 through 12. I'd like to read a piece of scripture. This is James. This is the brother of Jesus Christ. He says this about the power of words. He says, For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body, if we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts great things. Now the tongue, by the way, he's talking about is our words, our conversation. He says this, How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire. And the tongue, our words, can be a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of our life, a, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea, and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and our Father. 
And with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Friends, your heart is like a well. It's like a deep well. Your brain is like a bucket that you put into that well. Every time you engage into a conversation with someone else, your brain lowers the bucket into your heart, goes all the way down inside, and it pulls out whatever is inside your heart. And as it pulls out whatever is inside your heart, your brain then transfers to your mouth and your mouth speaks it. Friends, whatever is inside your heart, your mouth will say. It's a gateway, it's a doorway into what's really going on in the interior of our hearts. Friend, your mouth, husbands, your mouth, wives, your mouth is a power tool. It it can do amazing things. It can build up, it can tear down, it can shape, it can craft, or it can totally destroy. A few years ago, I bought a power tool. Uh, Our church has a wonderful ministry called Awana. And Awana, every single year, has the Awana Derby. Y'all know what I'm talking about, James? You know what I'm talking about. That's right, the Awana Derby. Our Awana ministry provides for the children blocks of wood. And we as parents are to help our kids shape and create and make out of these blocks of wood uh, an Awana car. Now, I've done this now for many years. And I will tell you, if you want to lose bring your car to me because I will make it lose for you, okay? Many years, we didn't even make it quite down the track, much to the tears of my children, okay? But so I was really frustrated. I was like, well, how can I shape these things? And, and a guy, a friend of mine says, you know what, sure, you need to buy a Dremel. How many of you have a Dremel? Anybody have a Dremel? Aren't they awesome? They're so much fun, right? They're really cool. And so he's like, yeah, you can use this Dremel to shape and mold your car. And I was like, great. So I went out and I bought this Dremel. And let me tell you something. I'm not a handy person. I had no idea how to use a Dremel. No idea. I just was like, okay, well, I'll try to figure it out. And so I opened up the instructions, and I began to read the instructions of this Dremel. And I realized that if I use the same instructions of my Dremel on my mouth, I would be in really good shape because this power tool requires a lot of supervision, and yet I give that power tool more supervision than I give my own mouth. Let me read. These are the instructions that came with. This is my Dremel right there. Not mine, but it came off a website. That's what it looks like. This is what it says. Number one, the instructions. Know your power tool. Know it. Get to know it. Understand what it can do, right? Friend, how well do you know the power tool of your mouth? How well do you know what it can do and the destruction that it can make or how it can make something out of nothing? Number two, keep guards in place on your power tool. Oh, friend, I tell you what, sometimes we like to shoot our mouths off. We take the guards off, and I promise you this, every time we loosen our lips, boy, we can create great havoc in our lives. Number three, and this is one that I actually thought was quite funny, when using your power tool, be careful around children. Amen to that. Amen to that. Now, every single one of us in this room, you have a pet word. Okay, it's that thing that you say whenever you hit your finger with a hammer. Okay, some of you go straight to cursing. Okay, some of you have other words that kind of start like a curse but don't actually go all the way there. Okay, now all of us have those. I have one too. I'm not going to say it out loud because I don't want y'all to repeat it, okay? But I've got one of these little words. It's not a bad word. It's not a curse word. It's not a big deal. But I've said it all my life. And, and as I have children, I, I realize how bad it sounds because of when my four-year-old says it, right? 
he, he says this word, and I'm like, where did you hear that word? And I'm like, oh, that came from me. <laughs> I better be careful how I say my words. I better be careful of the language that I speak, because guess what, friends? There's always someone listening. There's always somebody listening. We have to be careful. Number four, store idle tools when not in use. Amen to that. Sometimes it's best just to keep your mouth shut. Number five, don't overuse the tool without properly maintaining the equipment. Number six, this is very important, very important husbands, very important wives, never use the tool in an explosive atmosphere. Right? Friends, I'll tell you right now, as Angela and I have been married, we've had some explosive atmospheres. And there have been times where she has held her lips and I've held mine and it's been a better deal. But there have been times where we have struck the match of our mouths and stuff blows up. And I don't believe that's what Christ would want. Friends, perhaps the most powerful tool that we possess is not a Dremel, but it's our tongue. It's our words. It's our conversation and how we communicate with one another. Yet we show more caution to our power tools than the most powerful tool of all, which is our mouths. I want to read four brief scriptures to you. Proverbs 15, 1, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Proverbs 13, 3, whoever guards his mouth preserves his life. He who opens wide his lips comes to ruin. Proverbs 21, 23, whoever keeps his mouth and his tongue keeps himself out of trouble. Amen to that. Proverbs 25, 11, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in a setting of silver. Our takeaway points this morning, husbands and wives, make communicating and conversation a priority in your home. Practice it. Limit the distractions that would take away from using gracious and attractive language with one another. Number two, speak in a manner that your spouse would want to be spoken to. Don't raise your voice or be defensive. Let your talk be seasoned with salt. And lastly, realize that your words carry both life and death. They are powerful. They can encourage and create or they can tear down and destroy. My friends, brothers and sisters, go home today and begin to speak Christ into your relationships. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, Lord, we come before you today. Every one of us in this room is guilty of how we talk. We are guilty of how we communicate. And so, Father, today we ask your forgiveness and we pray that you will help us to communicate more like Jesus, that we would communicate as Christ would, and that our marriages would grow and blossom. And Father, Lord, for those of us that may not be married, I pray that we will take some of these helpful hints and that we will use them in our work situations or within our friendships, Lord. We can all do better at communicating. And so, Father, Lord, thank you for how your word talks to us, speaks to us, convicts us, and changes us. And we pray these things today in your name. Amen. Again, thank you so much for worshiping with us today. And again, I would point you to our website, www.myesbc.net. Again, thank you so much for worshiping with us. We hope that we will see you very soon. And we certainly hope that you enjoyed today's message. God bless you.